a, a number of people have, have said, Kevin Mangum, what in the world are you doing on the sustainment panel? <laughs> uh, I, I was never an, an aviation maintenance officer, but my father was one, and I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express <laughs> more than once. But I did learn very early on in my aviation career from many, many of the folks in the room that to be a successful uh, commander, it was all about flying and fixing airplanes. And the way that uh, an aviation commander builds and maintains combat power is by training and pulling phases. Now, phases may be passe as we go into the future, but it's going to be all about training and fixing. And in order to train, you got to fix. So this is super, uh, super important and will become more important in the future as we fight and sustain on the highly distributed battlefield that uh, we talked about or been talked about all day, particularly with the maintenance-free operating periods that, uh, that the Army's looking for in the next generation of aircraft. Additionally, it's vitally important that uh, because of life cycle costs, all of y'all, most of y'all know that 70% of the life cycle costs of a, of a program is in sustainment. So we got to get this right. And how does the army, uh, how does the army oper army aviation operate at best value? So we do have a great panel. You know, I think it was Omar Bradley that said that uh, strategy is for amateurs and logistics is for professionals. The good, the great news is, is there's a bunch of professionals to back up Kevin Mangum, the knuckle dragger, uh, <laughs> on this panel. So. Uh, Mr. Marriott, Bill Marriott was already introduced as the exec or the we keep the deputy to the commanding general of uh, AMCOM, uh, General Wally Rugen, uh, director of the Future Vertical Lift CFT, Major General Retired Jim Miles, president of Miles Associates, <laughs> um, Colonel Bill Morris, uh, the executive director of uh, Army programs at GE Aviation and Mr. Pat Mason, the, direct, the deputy uh, PEO of PEO Aviation. So a couple of these guys are recidivists. They've been on multiple panels, but that's because they are, they are so good. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Marriott to, to kick off. Thank you, sir. Um, first, let me thank the AUSA team, um, General Thurman, General Christian, General Swan, General Francis, um, former Sergeant Major of the Army Press. And thank you all very much for uh, having us here today, holding these things, and having the, uh, the faith, confidence, or just blind luck to, uh, to have me here. But of all the things they could have put on my name tag, U.S. Navy retired is probably the, the least likely to get <laughs> respect from this crowd anyway. Um, so I'll just, I'll just switch it to the Deputy the Commanding General of U.S. Army Aviation and, uh, and Missile Command. I've been in that position for about four and a half years. I served under... Uh, Jim Richardson and then Doug Gabram. When he left, there was about a five-month gap. That's why there's a confusion on my title. I go from executive director to DCG and, and, and back again, but I'm honored to do that. So thank you all very much for, for sticking around for the audience. Uh, logistics is first in your heart, maybe third on the program, but we understand where, we, where the re requirements and uh, the importance of it, as both panels before us mentioned, uh, logistics and sustainment. Um, so what I'm going to tell you now is probably the most important thing I will say, and that's an update of my boss, Major General Todd Royer. Um, I talked to uh, General Royer just about an hour ago um, during the last panel. Sorry for walking out, but we, we had to talk. Um, and uh, I told him I was going to go forward because every single person that I've seen here ha has asked about his health and condition. Uh, as, as most, if not all of you know, he suffered a medical incident on August 9th. Um, and had a follow-up incident on the 10th of August in the hospital. Um, without the quick reactions of two civilian employees who he happened to be discussing um, uh, his, his vision with uh, in the G3, one of whom uh, had just been recertified in CPR, the other was an off-duty uh, um, medical person uh, who got the paddles to him, uh, he would have died, and he'd be the first one to tell you that because his doctor told him he would have died. 5% chance of survival. The message he would want me to tell you is that he's doing fine, uh, and everybody really needs to think, no matter what kind of shape you're in, of work-life balance. And those of you who know Todd know that this is a young man at 53 um, who runs five miles every day, who comes to work at five and leaves at eight, um, 
et cetera, et cetera. Many of us have done that. Many of you may still do that. Um, but the real good news is he's doing fine. Uh, last week he came into the office for a couple hours a day. His, uh, his hours are limited by uh, General Perna, personally, and, uh, and General Rohrer's wife, Mary Lou, and with me as the, the bulldog to get him out of the office. Since everybody else is afraid to do that. Um, and I've got nothing to lose, right? So, um, But he, he started this week four hours a day. Uh, yesterday and today, he's, he's working eight hours a day. He's got the thumbs up from General Perna, uh, and he'll start again full time next week. He'll be able to travel, we think, later this month, but probably his first trip will be to Fort Rucker for the sustainment uh, conference that you've heard so much about. So he's doing fantastic, uh, and he is extremely grateful for everything, all the great wishes uh, and, and thoughts and prayers, and his entire family uh, is grateful for that, and they're doing very, very well, and he's very strong. So great news there to start off. So if, I don't, if you don't get anything else from what I might say, please, please take that forward. Um, the, the next thing is, as General Thurman showed us the book on MDO strategy, and he has read it, um, I can tell you that General Perna has read it as well. Could I get the chart, please? And I'm bringing the one chart. You can blame that on the Navy side if they, if they bring it up. There it is. Um, so what's of interest to General Perna is fascinating to us at AMCOM and the other major subordinate commands. And so this is a chart I used at Quad A uh, earlier this year, and then I spoke at the Space and Missile Defense Symposium because the principles are the same, whether it's aviation or missile, in that the sustainment between now and into the future, as far as we can see, is going to be critical to the operational success of any unit. Um, so I have a question I think is planted, is coming a little bit later on that I can talk a little bit more in depth. But just to lay out the chart, as approved by General Perna, as you may or may not know if you were at um, AUSA in Huntsville earlier this year, General Perna laid out his strategy and his focus on the strategic support area as AMC's primary objective. Within that strategic support area, there are seven uh, critical focus areas that he has bucketed, if you would. And from left to right, if you can't read it, I, I apologize for that, but installation readiness, uh, supply availability and equipment readiness, munitions readiness, strategic power projection, industrial base readiness, soldier and family readiness, and logistics information. These are the things he's got us focused on. And I would tell you at AMCOM, from our perspective, we touch all of them in some way, probably more primarily in the installation readiness where we're talking about Fort Rucker as a power projection platform. Army aviation starts at Fort Rucker and the ability to push pilots through as discussed by General Francis in his opening. Um, and a big function, functional part of that is the sustainment of the fleet, the maintenance of the fleet at Fort Rucker and the parts and getting that right. And we're involved in, a, in an effort right now that General Perna is personally looking at and driving uh, to fix the maintenance at Fort Rucker and in, improve the parts, specifically on the Lakota side. But PEO Aviation has put a lot of money into it. We've put a lot of time and en energy into it, and General Francis, General Perna are leading that effort. Supply availability and equipment readiness uh, goes without saying. That's, those are the cornerstones for us and what we do in, in providing those parts and improving OR rates. So OR rates have been tremendous uh, over the last seven or eight months. Those of you who sit on the MAR or listen in on the, the monthly aviation readiness review that Forcecom holds will know that we've made goal, the 75% goal, for about the last seven months. Uh, and that's great, but we have to micromanage a lot of parts to get there. The real question we should be asking right now and in the future, are we ready to fight tonight? And I would tell you we are, but maybe only tonight, because once there's a surge and we can expect a 50% increase in demand on parts, we don't have the strategic depth on the shelf of those critical readiness drivers, and that's something we can talk about later. Um, the next one I bring up is industrial base readiness. Of course, not only the organic industrial base, which for us in AMCOM means uh, CCAD in the aviation side and Letterkenny more on the missile side and support side, uh, but it also includes all of our partners, represented here by Bill Morris at the end next to Pat. Um, we don't do anything without our partnerships, both internal to the Army, uh, as the team we mentioned before, the six-pack has, has, has tacked a lot of issues, but also externally with Boeing, Sikorsky, Honeywell, GE, on and on and on, which we meet with those folks every week at the action officer and GS-15 level, and every month, General Royer and myself meet with, with multiple companies. We have six right now that we're meeting every month going after supply availabilities and industrial base readiness. Um, the soldier and family readiness I will mention is a bucket because people have been mentioned as the chief's top issue that he's focused on. And of course, you don't make any of this happen 
without people. Um, and then logistics information. Uh, many of you, uh, the green suit here, are, are familiar with what we've done, what General Perna has driven for G Army, um, increment two, w increment one, wave two, I think it is, is which is the, the aircraft notebook and the G Army uh, tie-in that we've got now. And we've fielded that almost everywhere. Fort Rucker's still going through the last bit of that. But it's fully funded, the equipment's funded, and we hope to make a significant difference with that. And that's just in the near term. Um, some of the, uh, the issues that I bring up, you could call them problems, you could call them challenges, we call them opportunities. Uh, but it's been mentioned earlier, how are we going to sustain multiple variants of our fleets? And just like Bell mentioned, we also talk a lot about the Black Hawk. Why? Because right now, we have Lima and Mike's. Pretty shortly, we're going to have Lima, Mike's, Victor's. And they're going to continue on, you heard, till 2050 or beyond. Uh, and throw into that flora, and we've got multiple variants that we have to support. Uh, the Limas are not going to go away. Anybody that thought that they're just going to be retired in the next five to ten years, that's not going to happen. I think Pat could probably talk about that. So we're looking at decades of multiple variants. How are we going to sustain those? When those aircraft are also FMS aircraft, the same supply system, and in a lot of cases, direct commercial sales, which is a huge issue from our perspective because we cannot see direct commercial sales especially a problem on the missile side where we're competing with direct commercial sales for specific Patriot parts. It's the same on the aviation side, too. Uh, so those are, those are concerns. How are we going to do that? And how are we going to get to the strategic depth we need so we can fight tonight and tomorrow and for the next however many months or years that we need to? The next thing that I'd call an opportunity or challenge is getting after the end time. I mentioned that our OR rates are tremendous. Our, uh, S time rates or supply time rates that goes into that equation are in the three to five percent range, historic lows. Uh, we can't go much lower than that. But the M time is, is significant. It's above 20 percent in a lot of cases. So how can AMCOM, how can the team, the six pack, go after the M time? Some of it uh, may be by thinking differently. Uh, Chinook is going to come out with a message here pretty soon that's going to affect uh, how they do maintenance, go to a more of an MSG-3, those of you familiar with what the commercial aviation maintenance is like, more of a concept uh, along those lines that get out of the schedule maintenance business. We need to be more predictive, as you can see on, on some of the charts here, so we can anticipate using all that CBM plus data we have to be predictive and take parts off before they fail on us. That's one of the other areas that's open for discussion. Advanced manufacturing along with advanced distribution on the battlefield, will be great challenges and opportunities for us in the future. I did not know it, but General Royer told me that many of the cabs have additive manufacturing capabilities. That's frankly very scary because I don't know that there's standardization at this point. I don't know that there's a digital thread that's secure that allows people to print parts off. We have to get after that. I know AMC is getting after the, the additive manufacturing piece. Wouldn't it be great if you could print some parts on the battlefield? Um, that's, that's a challenge in the airworthiness side for aviation, obviously. There's some, though, you probably can. Um, open systems architecture that uh, General Rugen has talked about versus the tech data that we need right now to be able to continue to sustain the fleet. And we're going to need that for those fleets that are going to continue for the next 30 years. There's some challenges there. But I believe, honestly, with all my heart, that General Rugen and his team are on the right path with MOSA and where they're going. Um, and, and for us, reforming the depots to be able to surge, the modernization, the facilitization, the partnership with our OEMs to allow us to, in fact, be subs to them so we can help produce, provide a second or third source of supply to get that strategic depth that we need. And lastly, and something that's kind of not been discussed too much in aviation until recently, is General Perna's vision for strategic floats. Uh, repair cycle floats, they were called. He calls them strategic cycle floats at this point. But imagine if we could take some Blackhawks as we uh, modernize the fleet. Instead of demilling, maybe we had uh, a couple of, of Blackhawks. So when a uh, cab had a long lead time part or an accident or something, we could replace that pull that other one back to Corpus or wherever, fix it, and keep that kind of cycle going. We're already doing that a little bit on the missile side. On the aviation side, there's some great opportunities. But not just in major end items, but also with secondary parts. We're looking at, we think we can get to that point quicker than maybe the major end items. So the biggest threat to everything I've just described, to me anyway, is, uh, is the budget. Without uh, consistent and predictable funding provided to us by Congress, 
this all kind of stops and falls apart. That's the one message that whenever we have the opportunity, we had a breakfast a couple months ago and we were able to, to get that across. Uh, here we are in the first week of September, we don't have a budget. We do have the framework in place. Uh, but if we go into a CR, a con continuing resolution, that is a significant challenge as contracts don't work well that way. We can't move forward in 2020 and all of what we've talked about today may come to a halt. So sir, I'll stop there uh, and turn it over to the rest of the team. Well, you mentioned your question. Why don't you go ahead and take the first question? Sure, sure. So I, I would encourage everybody to ask us questions that we didn't, we didn't plant. Um, but my question is, is really the, the MDO force uh, is ex expected to employ precision logistics that provide a layered, agile, and responsive sustainment capability necessary to support operations from the SSA strategic support area to the deep maneuver area. So how do we envision an AMC and AMCOM, the current systems evolving to provide this critical capability and depth to both our fielded and future force? And that's why we put this chart together. How will we migrate or evolve our capabilities, which are on the left side of that chart, and this is just from an AMCOM perspective, but you can imagine all 11 now of the uh, major subordinate commands uh, to AMCOM, I mean to uh, AMC, specifically the four life cycle management commands of AMCOM, TACOM, CECOM, and JMC, have similar kind of capabilities. Our core competencies, as you can see, are support to acquisition. We are partnered with the PEOs. We're partnered with, with General Rugen. In fact, they reside in our building just below General Royer's office. Uh, sustainment logistics, was, which is our core uh, centerpiece of our skill sets, having all those civilian logisticians that are part of all the PMs, uh, part of the CFT, part of Futures Command. That's our expertise, and uh, that's right in our wheelhouse. Field maintenance. Many of you are familiar with not only the depot field teams, but with the reset that we have through the RASMs, two RASMs right now. Um, and uh, reset is changing now based on General Abrams' requirement and desire to not reset every aircraft just because it's been in the desert. That was causing us a problem uh, with our maintainers, frankly. There was a case of one cab that went two years without doing a phase. Why? Because they were deployed and the force manning levels did not allow them to deploy with maintainers. They came back, went right into reset. So how we expect the expertise um, to, to improve if we don't give them the aircraft. So we're looking for ways to continue uh, at the force manning levels and these uh, continue the way they are. Uh, the reset piece is now uh, based on a formula so aircraft that truly require it will go through reset, giving the aircraft back to the commanders uh, to employ them and to their maintainers. Uh, calibration, you may or may not know, but all the Army's calibration belongs to AMCOM and USADO, which is the, uh, the test measurement and diagnostic uh, equipment activity. They also own the Army Primary Standards Lab. They set the standards for a lot of things that are calibrated and measured, include radiation. Um, security assistance has been mentioned earlier. The Security Assistance Management Direction, Directorate under AMCOM is responsible this year for approximately $15 billion in sales. Um, and of course, 50-something uh, billion dollars are active cases right now, as, as mentioned. The last two, contracting and engineering support, do not belong uh, directly to AMCOM. They are, contracting is still OPCON to General Royer. Uh, which allows us to have unity of command and unity of effort. And as you can imagine, contracting is a limiting factor in a lot of cases. I don't know, has allowed us to get after the long uh, acquisition lead times and production lead times that we, uh, we see, those long lead time parts that cause us to come to a halt in a lot of areas. And then the engineering support that's provided by part of Futures Command used to be called AMRDEC. It's now CCDC Aviation and Missile Center. And specifically, many of you are familiar with the Aviation Engineering Directorate, which provides support to General Royer and his role as the Army Airworthiness Authority. So left to right, I'm not going to get into them too much, but the ready force, the modern force, and the multi-domain force, and just, just looking at uh, sustainment logistics, for example. We went from supply chain improvements that we're trying to do now to strategic depth, which is zero back orders, uh, older than 30 days, and three months uh, stock on hand of our most critical readiness drivers. How are we doing with that? Um, our contract authority is a little over $1.2 billion. Um, we have 14,000 NINs items that our item managers 
are controlled. Of those, only about 3,500 are active. That means they have demands on them on a routine basis. So of those 3,500, we have about 34 that are aviation critical readiness drivers. Very small percentage of the 14,000. Yet we spend nearly 20% of our contract authority on those items. That's how important it is to get to strategic debt. We've been able to move uh, get well dates, which is what I described, uh, to the left by, in one case, four years. Nevertheless, in some cases, um, think Blackhawk Lima Legacy Blades. We have a handful on the shelf with over 500 back orders, and our average monthly demand is 84 a month. Those are the things that General Royer and our team, along with everybody else here, is focused on improving um, and ultimately get to an adaptable, predictive, prognostic supply chain where we need to go. And by working with the OEMs, we're working on multiple sources of supply. That's been a vulnerability. In one case, um, it, I won't go into the specifics too much, but we have one MDS that uh, 27 sole source parts are provided by Turkey. Think about that. Turkey's in NATO, right? There's no problem there until they try to buy a Russian radar, and now we've got problems. Um, so we've, we've actually dug this up when we worked with our OEMs in these monthly meetings, and now they're getting a second and a third source of supply. Those are concerns, and they all lead to a supply chain that's incredibly fragile. But we're focused on it, and some of these are notional in concept. Some of them we're working very hard right now, but that's how we will we'll evolve, sir. Great. Thanks, Thanks Bill. General Miles, sir. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks, just like everybody else. Just these forums are so powerful. Um, General Swan, General McQuishan, thank you for letting us do this. Um, you know, when you take a look at where we are right now, it's kind of important from a strategic perspective to look at it. And when I sit here and see what the Army's doing right now, you, know, you look at us trying to make change and do some things. What's got to happen at the, is that everybody at the top's got to buy in. And I have never seen our Army... Um, since I've been in it, it's been a long time. Um, I've never seen our army so aligned from the very top all the way through. So with that comes two things. Recognize the opportunity that we can make change where in the past we may not have been able to make the change. Uh, so the conditions have changed. The second thing is, you know, be thankful for it and take advantage of it and move, move out because these things won't come up very often. And so uh, ch with change comes opportunity. It also comes uh, the recognition that, uh, that we do need to, uh, to move out. And, um, you know, with all this change we're talking about with the CFTs, you know, I, I can't go any further without mentioning General Thurman's comments, okay? Those things about training, you know, train the way you think you're gonna fight so you can fight the way you trained, all that matters. And it does, sir, appreciate your comments about that. And we need to be talking about that. What we're talking about is being intentional not only training with our aviators, but training with our maintainers. And there's three points that I want to bring up today. First of all, when you introduce two new, uh, two new platforms into this formation, it's not just about maintenance. Just think about what's going on in, inside of Dave Francis's formation. Not only is he trying to lead the six pack plus one, but he's also has to figure out how he's gonna put two new aircraft in there, come up with the training curriculum, come up with the IPs, come up with the maintainers, figure out a way to make that and to put that into contract maintenance and oh by the way maybe I can come up with a couple additional hangars that General Ostevich didn't go to when he went to flight school so long ago I mean I sure would be nice to have brand new facilities down there that's just one little small uh, small element that talks about but what I'm talking about is what I'd like to talk about now is the maintenance side of this um, and that is how do you get two new platforms um, to in support and sustain them in a combat operation when uh, uh, when you're already doing great work here with the with the Blackhawk and the Chinook and the Apache and the fixed wing and all the rest, because it's about, as General Thurman said, it's about that five-sided building is about prioritization and the way you prioritize is with funding and how do you make that happen. And so the first thing I, I, I want to talk about is the soldier. What do we want our main maintenance soldier to do? Um, and I would submit to you that, that probably the next step we need to be doing is down at Fort Rucker is Rucker and litmus test is those that are responsible for training of what, what should our soldiers' capabilities be, they need to be talking to the folks at AVMIC, formerly known as AMRDEC, because they're the ones that know what this guy over here to my left is trying to do and what's the science and technology and how much do we want that soldier to do. Do we want him to just replace the black box and move on? That's a different skill set than being an artisan 
out on the flight line to do the troubleshooting in O's and ones. It's a different concept, and, and it's not too early to be talking about that so we can have the dialogue so that we understand what's the training requirement for these maintainers that are out there in an austere environment. I would submit to you we need to kind of go more towards the artisan and, and, and walk away from their place in black boxes because if you understand multi-domain ops, it's about working in a, austere environments. So that's the one thing I'd, I'd say about soldiers. Second thing is contractor maintenance, okay? I'm not sure I have a different opinion than General Thurman because I've every time I've disagreed with him, I've been wrong, okay? So I'll say it this way. Our aircraft um, and our MTOs are based on, you picked the number back when I was somewhat current and relevant, it was about 14 hours for aircraft per month is what our TOE was manned to do. If we can assure that our OP4 or the people that are trying to do us harm will make sure that we never fly above 14.5 hours for aircraft per month during combat ops, we're good. But if we don't, how are we gonna maintain, how are we gonna maintain that additional maintenance capability that's required? Okay, and that's what we gotta get after because getting blue suitors on the battlefield, contract maintenance, is something that we need to intentionally talk about. If we think we have to, then okay, then let's make sure we understand they are our, they're our flexible, our variable force, but let's be intentional about how we're gonna do it in a multi-domain operation. Or find a way to increase the maintenance capability or decrease the maintenance requirements that are out there. And so that's what I wanna talk about from a third piece, which is how do we, how do we absorb a, two more platforms into the aviation maintenance uh, enterprise and do it with the least uh, afford uh, the least amount of money, and also do it with the best capability that we can do. And um, no surprise, uh, pay attention to what we've kind of done before. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about it. You know, we talk about the digital backbone for for Flara and Fara. I'm talking about a common digital backbone throughout the entire fleet, both current and future aircraft. Okay, with that comes great things that we can learn from. This guy's got the uh, ITEP engine, okay? Okay, this is commonality throughout the entire, the entire fleet. Do you think we possibly could have ever come up with a way to increase the, 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 uh, the uh, fuel, or decrease the fuel flow and increase the horsepower by 50%, decrease fuel flow by 25%, I'm, I'm hosing up the numbers, but significant increases if we had told the Apache PM, the Blackhawk PM, and the Chinook PM to try and do that yourself? No. We came up with it because we had a common idea. We, we joined together, the six pack drove a Ford and you now have, you, you now have an ITEP engine here that's gonna be laid out throughout the entire fleet. And oh, by the way, as we're trying to break new ground, guess who just picked up the ITEP engine for common alley. With common cockpit, what we see, or common, common engines, we see a reduction in overall life cycle sustainment costs. Less you gotta manage and, and, and you're, if you look at multi-domain ops, the more commonality you have, the better you're going to be able to reduce the sustainment footprint. Now, go, go. So let's take a boy. Wouldn't it be great to have the same rotor blades on Chinooks, Apaches, Blackhawks, Flora, Flora? Yeah, it'd be great. Ain't going to make sense. Some dynamic components are going to be different. It's just a fact of life. However, if you take a look at what's going on in in the 160th, is a, a way of saying common cockpit, Blackhawk. They're, they're MH60, they're MH47, and now their MH6s have a common cockpit. Okay, with that drives down the cost. You can feel it, you can sustain it. Now, how do you do a common cockpit with both current and, and the digital force? Well, if you can't do dynamic components, what about the, the digital backbone? What, backbone? what about the mission systems equipment? There's a couple things that need to happen. First, you've heard it. Some people call it a four letter word. I think it's a great four letter word, MOSA. Okay, it's about standards of interface. MOSA doesn't mean easy. MOSA means, means that we all agree that we're gonna have an open system architecture. But there's only so much you can do in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in an open system architecture unless you have the multi-core processing capability that you need to enable MOSA. I would submit to you between, um, between MOSA and multi-core processing, and I'm not talking about multi-core processes that are certified at one core, which we're seeing a lot of people have now today. I'm talking about multi-core processors that you can use all of the cores, gives you a significant capability that if you're using open system architecture, now you have something that's, that's something I've never seen before, which is the fact that your current fleets, if your current fleets 
are given the task that says use multi-core processors. Go towards the, the, the MOSA standard. And oh, by the way, the Apache is different than the Blackhawk and the Chinook, but somewhere along the line, there needs to be a point where you, Mr. PM, are going to have your aircraft MOSA certified with multi-core processing capability that's just like his. There's nothing magical about MOSA, and there's nothing magical about a multi-core processor. All the, what that does is it enables us to, to apply all, all of the, stay up on the leading edge of, capa, of the technology and capability. So now think about what we've just done. If we can have common cockpits and common interfaces and com using the, the same plug and play, not only have we increase capability, as Dave Francis said, not all brigades are created equal, we'll be able to take and, and, and apply different capabilities to, to units that need that capability, but maybe, maybe not apply it to that aircraft, to that brigade that doesn't need it. But from an AMC perspective, from a logistics sustainment perspective, now what you have is you, you have common black boxes, you have common capability. You have an ability to take those same systems and in a multi-domain operation, you've reduced the footprint and you're able to put them in key areas. So that's, um, I never thought I'd talk about multi-core processors or MOSA as a way of sustainment, but there it is. That's my, my thoughts on that. Th thanks very much. Uh, his uh, comments about the common a <clears throat> avionics architecture system that uh, the 160th had, uh, just as an aside, I was the commander of the 160th, and I was down at Fort Rucker talking to, to uh, Brigadier General E.J. Sinclair, the commander of Fort Rucker, and uh, we, we, this topic came up, and I said, I told him, sir, that, uh, you know, the 160th bought common aviation architecture system because they're common. I said, that was the intent for the Army, but you wanted CAS, but you got ass. Uh, because nothing was common about it. He was not nearly as amused about that as I was. Um, Pat, the next, the next question to uh, Bill Moore, sir. Thanks, General Mangum, and uh, thanks, uh, General Swan and ma'am, for uh, allowing me to participate in the panel. Here from uh, General Electric Aviation, it's great to be amongst uh, many mentors and friends, uh, particularly General Thurman. Everybody's got a General Thurman story. Uh, and it, 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 it's about trust. Uh, he would call inevitably every Friday at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 at night, and uh, down to his office in the G3, he'd say, hey, Bill, get on down here. And then so I'd make my way down the three flights of escalators into his office. i go, this isn't going to be a good weekend. And he'd go, tell me about what the vice w wants to hear about MI-17. So I'd sit there and go on for 15 minutes and tell him about that and go, good sit at my computer and type down what, I, what you just said <laughs> and sign it JD. <laughs> Lady, ladies and gentlemen, that's trust. And, and, and it's a key theme between uh, industry and our, our partners, our government partners. Uh, every month we have to uh, uh, brief the AMCOM commanding general uh, over the summer, I had the pleasure to uh, brief Mr. Marriott on several occasions. And you got to tell the good, bad, and the ugly. It's not, it's not always going to be good. And uh, you have to show your warts. And when you do, you have to have a plan of remediation, and that's how you build trust. And it starts with that as a building block. So because we're going to have the T-701 engine uh, in the fleet over the next uh, 30 years easily before it's phased out completely. And uh, we have to worry about that engine every day. And uh, even though it's a 40-year-old engine, things happen. We talked about suppliers and how do you manage suppliers. Suppliers go out of business. And you have to be cognizant of ways to try to mitigate that risk. One of the ways General Electric is uh, mitigating that risk is doing, uh, as Mr. Marriott talked about, we've invested heavily in additive manufacturing, where we take composites that are lightweight, highly heat tolerant, and we're able to build uh, what used to be 200 part pieces into one component of an aircraft engine, reducing the supply chain and also lightening the load of, of the uh, PLL and ASL for our soldiers. Uh, one of the other things, GE uh, we recently uh, just won the ITEP engine program. Uh, that went on to full swing. Uh, we're, we're working with all five of the uh, FARA OEMs right now, 
and uh, providing them information uh, to meet General Rugen's type timeline, which is uh, leads to the question that I was given on what drives industry uh, to invest in technology and future programs. And, and to most of you, you'd think that's easy. Sometimes it's not. Uh, industry will get a lot of mixed signals sometimes. You'll get draft RFPs and RFPs for programs that you'll put a lot of money in. And if you don't have a program gets canceled or terminated for some reason and the money goes to another program, that's difficult. And, and it, it makes industry less likely to invest their, their industry research and development dollars in that program. But when you get a signal from General Rugen or someone like that who's going and you're seeing the funds uh, arrive in the budget, you're seeing things like FARA come out in record time from uh, RFP to award, that makes GE want to invest in Army aviation. And that's the direction we're going in. Even as we're looking towards uh, the future long range reconnaissance uh, assault aircraft, we're looking at that engine right now, making investments. We know that it's, a, it's going to be a long road, but that's what's driving industry's interest. We're also doing work in MOSA and have set up a separate investment in research and development to work on the MOSA problem, because we know that's going to go across multiple airframes uh, throughout the Army. And it's not just going to be the two aircraft, as, as uh, General Rugen is trying to field, but it's going to be across the entire aircraft fleet that will be out there for at least the next 20 to 30 years in the field. So uh, I'm happy to be here from GE Aviation, answer any of your questions, and uh, great to see many of you. Thank you. Over to Pat Mason. Pat Mason. Well, once again, it's, uh, it's great to be here on behalf of uh, Major General Todd, the PEO, and thanks to AUSA and to this panel for, uh, for allowing us to participate and certainly teaming with AMCOM as we look at fleet sustainment and fleet management and how we do that as a collective team across Army Aviation to ensure that the force is ready. And then we also understand the investments we need to make in the enduring fleet as we move forward to ensure from a reliability, availability, maintainability, and cost perspective that we're optimizing those investments, uh, particularly as we go through the Alcoff Fund, as many of you are familiar with, and we make determinations of what components we want to invest in to increase or really return reliability. Um, the question that I have is really tied to that, and I'm, I'm going to combine a couple of them together that has to do with as an aging, as the fleet ages, the cost per flight hour increases. Um, we have a lot of data that is available to us, and so what are we doing from a data perspective? And part of it was conditions-based maintenance. So I would take a step back and say when you talk conditions-based maintenance, you first have to ask, what do you mean by that? Uh, there was a period when, if you mentioned CBM, the thought was, I have sensors on an aircraft, I'm looking at certain things, and I am going to drive towards being able to work on unscheduled maintenance by turning it into schedule maintenance. Uh, I would say the, the way that we're approaching it these days is that it's a much larger context when you look at the richness of the data sources that we have out there now and how that all combines together in order to optimize fleet maintenance cycles. So that can be what is on board in a diagnostic sensor. It can be what is on board or what you get out of ACN, the aircraft notebook, what comes out of G-Army, what comes out of LNP, what comes out of the 2410 database, as well as what comes out of GFIBS, which is the financial engine, right, that tells us what the cost is. And so our challenge has been how do you take that because it's petabytes of data and sort through that data in a more efficient manner to make decisions on how you optimize fleet support investments and that translates everything down from what can be done on the flight line all the way to the supply chain to how you then do those ram C investments for the, the fleets of the future. Um, I, I'll give you like a success story, and, and Bill Marriott mentioned it, was MSG3. Our ability to put that in place for the Chinook and change the cycle times that we were doing maintenance and going away from some of the standards that had been longstanding within the Army to more of what is used in the commercial model was a significant effort. But that took an extraordinary amount of time because of the airworthiness aspects associated with it. And so by leveraging data, how do you pull that back so that we can do that? The same thing happened when we extended the U-860 phase hours. That took an extensive amount of time, and we had to defend very rigorously, as we should, the why behind it because it involves airworthiness and safety of flight. Uh, and so what I will tell you is what's going on right now is really really three things that look at scheduled maintenance, unscheduled maintenance, trending in data that allows us to see activities before they take place, and then being able to optimize really the, the fleet cost and, and really our investment. 
The first one is how do we handle that large data? It's been hard for the Army to do it, so what we've done is we've actually teamed with the Engineering Research Development Center uh, that is down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. It sounds rather odd when I say that the engineering center that deals with floods and everything else, but when you look at a center that can do high advanced computational fluid dynamics for water, they can handle Army aviation data. So we've taken data, we've put it down there now, and we're actually using their big iron uh, to work through and understand how we can handle that data and the computational algorithms that we need. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a geek, so you guys are going to have to listen to computational <laughs> algorithms for a while, right? But this is the science underneath it. And so that's a piece of it. The second piece of it is how do we score more data when it comes in? Because we all understand that a crew chief can misspell UH-60 60 times over when they mean the same thing. And so how do we score that? Well, in many cases, that was a manual process. It still is a manual process. And so using machine learning, we've got AVMIC now working on machine learning that will allow us to score a much, much larger set of that data. That makes a much, more, a, a much richer data environment that we have. So between how do we handle the data and then what are we doing with the data via AVMIC and the machine learning that's there, plus, you know, and everybody calls it AI. AI is nothing but a bunch of math, right? It's a bunch of math and neural networks that are behind it is what companies are out there and what other organizations have some of these algorithms, and we've got a number of them, and there's a number of pilots that are going on to look specifically at those algorithms and how those algorithms come into play to being able to effectively translate that data into actionable information that allows us to optimize both the fleet maintenance, the cycle maintenance, the costs associated with it as we move to the future. And so this is actually a really exciting period of time as we look at this, and it is really where the greatest opportunity is for the integration of artificial intelligence, machine learning right off the bat, is on the sustainment side. And I'll give you just one tangible example of that. When you do the usage spectrum, which often determines the cycle maintenance times as well as the fatigue lives for components, it's typically based on a worst case engineering assessment that goes into what's called the OMSP. Many people are familiar with it. The reality is that we don't typically fly in those robust environments. And if you take the data from the aircraft and you really compare it to what you've been flying, not what was projected for it, what does that do to extend out the amount of time before you get to heavy maintenance that needs to be done? Th that is, we are on the cusp of being able to do that, but it does fundamentally cause us to change the way we've operated and make people uncomfortable. Because now we will allow data to determine when we would do certain things as opposed to what's always been in our book because we do it every 10 hour, 14 day. We always do it every 250 hours because that's the way it's been for years and years and years. And so there's lots of cultural things that go along with that that really get into the whole maintenance Dotland PF as opposed to just how the data can be used as we look at fleet management for the future. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it, it really actually is an exciting time. We do recognize the cost per flight hour for an enduring fleet. And part of our analysis working with AMCOM is how do we attack that successfully using this holistic conditions-based maintenance approach. Thanks, Pat. Uh, I'm going to break protocol here, this, this, and I'm going to answer one. Uh, this question is, uh, may have been better suited with the training panel, but it's appropriate for this one as well. Um, how is aviation maintenance and sustainment training being re-energized for our company-grade officer corps following 18-plus years of conflict where large-scale forward operating bases and contract maintenance reduce our junior's leader, leader's need to perform, practice, and execute aviation maintenance and sustainment operations in an MDO environment. And I'm going to expand that to NCOs as well. Uh, and, and this is based on uh, work several of us did with the Holistic Aviation Assessment Task Force and what we found. And among our 63 findings, uh, or re well, among our findings and, and the 63 recommendations was that uh, based on contract maintenance and some of the force, <coughs> force deployment level limits that uh, were in place uh, downrange that we weren't deploying our maintainers. And we had a huge deficit in aviation maintenance expertise and our mid-grade, and in some cases our more senior grade NCOs and certainly with our junior officers. So maintainers weren't deploying. They were at home. They didn't have aircraft to work on, so they got to pull a lot of guard, paint rocks, stuff soldiers love to do. 
particularly aviation maintenance soldiers, so there was this huge deficit. So among the recommendations, and some of these they're moving out on, and I'll look to General Francis to make sure that I'm not screwing this up, one was looking at the schoolhouse and making the training skills-based instead of task-based, so that the skills were more transferable from task to task. Readiness levels for our aviation maintainers, just like we do with aviators, because a Sergeant E-5 or E-6 could show up in your formation, and you would expect them to be a journeyman maintainer, but they didn't know which end of the torque wrench to, to grab. So to have readiness levels to show what, this is deja vu all over again, General Thurman, <laughs> kind of a digital job book, so a soldier shows up, you know what he or she has done and has not done, and you can put them on a focused training program. Deploying coherent formations where maintenance is going organic to the formation, trying to do that to the maximum extent possible. And maybe the biggest driver, am I getting this right so far? You're on. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> maybe the biggest driver in all of this, and uh, Bill Marriott mentioned the monthly aviation readiness reviews. What we found in this was because aviation is complicated and we've detached, uh, you know, brigade formations deploy separately from the division headquarters. There really was, for lack of a more pleasant term, a la gross lack of supervision at division level and above of aviation formations. And our colonels were doing great. So I know J my good friend General Abrams, when I told him that, uh, he implemented the monthly aviation readiness review chaired by the Deputy Commanding General of Forces Command. And I can tell you, new religion <laughs> spread across the land because people do what bosses check. Corps commanders usually, or deputies in a meeting with the Force Com Deputy Commanding General being asked questions about their maintenance. Division Deputy Commanders down. So it, stuff and good tidings flow downhill. <laughs> and... Uh, so it came down to, it became a function of supervision, who owned the task, and, uh, and that flowed down to our, AV, our commissioned officer leaders. There are some other ancillary uh, uh, efforts in place on certifying our, um, better surf, certifying um, our tracked warrant officers and maintainers. So there is, there is clear recognition that that needed to happen. It, I'm happy to say that it is happening, and uh, coming to a theater near you will be, uh, I think, trained and ready aviation mid, mid and senior grade NCOs. Was I close? Yes, sir. We still work to do, but uh, you're, you're correct. We're moving out on all of this. Um, so the good news is that we got a lot of questions stacked up here. The bad news is we got seven more minutes. <laughs> So I'm going to throw one. I'm going to I'm going to throw one to General Rugen. Yeah, it was Clubber Lang. Pain. <laughs> With General Abrams in the in the Mars, and it was and the pain stopped at the one star level. So uh, um, it was certainly uh, that. Um, but the the force has gotten uh, you got a, the force's attention. So this uh, question, warfighters concept doctrine, has changed at least four times since Vietnam. This is not the case for our uh, support, sustain, maintain concept doctrine. Uh, Futures Command is driving MDO. Who is driving su support, sustain, maintain of MDO? Uh, it is a Dotlam issue, and uh, yes. So General Francis and I, uh, I don't know how many hours the Dotlam uh, PFP briefing took. We just finally gave it to uh, General Richardson. Um, we will give it to the G3 of the Army here soon. Uh, we have an exhaustive um, decision support template across Dotlam uh, when it comes to all of the future force. Um, and again, I think we have very good shared understanding between um, the Center of Excellence, the CFT, the Greater Six Pack, uh, and now having outbriefed uh, Futures Command. Um, they're consolidating that across all of the eight CFTs and the six uh, Army modernization priorities. So the Dotlam uh, PF analysis is alive and well. Uh, we are inherently focused on the life cycle cost and, um, and we, we spend a lot of time on it. It doesn't, 
you know, get the flashy headlines, but uh, I can tell you we spend a lot of our time on it. Bill Marriott, sir. Sir, again, it, it's been an honor to be on this panel. Since I'm staring at a five-minute clock, I think each of us could have 30, 45 seconds to do some closing comments. I'll start at the far end with Pat, if you just want to say a couple words, Pat. Again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And as I, as I said, it's really a partnership with AMCOM and with the entire sustainment enterprise in order to effectively maintain the, uh, the enduring fleet while we plan for the future fleet. And so from a PEO perspective, um, this is, quite honestly, where I spend a lot of my day, is to make sure that in conjunction with AMCOM that we are meeting the needs of the field so that they are ready now, ready to fight now. Um, but then also ensuring that we're using some of our advanced methodologies for the future fleet. Uh, because we do realize, as was said, is that the life cycle cost uh, is really in the sustainment, and the optimization of that cost really drives the affordability. And to go back to the earlier panel where we talked about CAPE, CAPE is concerned about long-term affordability of programs, which means that we, the PEO, have to absolutely understand design, design decisions that are influencing the life cycle and the sustainment cost of anything that we send out to the field. So again, thanks very much for the opportunity to participate in the panel, and I will pass it down to you, Bill. Bill. Thanks. Uh, again, thanks for uh, having me on the panel today. I appreciate it. and. Uh, I think as we're moving forward, again, things that industry will do are, are going to be based largely upon what we see in roadmaps, guidance, and things that come to fruition in funded documents that uh, we can act on. Uh, with that said, additive manufacturing going forward is going to be key and critical. Uh, FAA certified parts for, av for the aviation fleet, you're not going to be able to produce those overnight. The first batches are an LRIP, so there's going to have to be an initial investment if you want to be able to do that additive manufacturing of those parts that are flight safety critical. For door handles and things like that, additive manufacturing will probably be good, for, and, but that does not have to have the same level of detail and, and certification as GE is developing for our bigger engines and jets. And finally, I think some of the things here uh, are interesting in that perhaps going to things like digital twins for our maintenance programs for logbooks where PCs can actually see what's going on real time in the aircraft and it's distributed and you, a you have exactly what's going on in the aircraft in your production control. It's out there now. The airlines are using it. We just have to be able to transition it at the right cost to the government. So thank you. General Miles. Yeah, uh, there's a principal war called mass. And if you think of the Army, we're mass. We're big, okay? And, um, you know, I've, I've looked at Army for a lot, from, from the soft community to conventional to being one of those dreaded testers at ATAC to being AMCOM. I've never seen our Army be in a position to where they are as leaning forward and willing to do things out of the box than now. I mean, this thing with OTA that's going on with FVL and what's happening with Flora and willing to do things differently, the dialogue that's going on with industry, if you don't like it now, it's really going to suck when it slows down, okay, because this is as good as it gets. Look, at, we're probably the turtles with Nikes if you want to look at it that way. I'm telling you, I don't, I've never seen the Army work better. Take advantage of this opportunity to increase the, our war fighting capability because we don't see this every day, and that has to do with leaders that care at the very top, and I'm just so thankful for them, and uh, thanks for your attention. Cool. Okay, uh, just a couple uh, high-level concepts. You know, our assumption uh, in the FVL, CFT, and Futures Command is that, you know, technology in the digital age is de inherently deflationary. Uh, industry, you can't keep that all to yourself. You're going to have to share it with the Army if you want to see these things uh, through, and cost is on the forefront of our mind. So we have an affordability KPP, both for procurement and life cycle, that we're sticking to. And uh, General McConnell routinely choke slams me on that. Uh, and he's right to do it. Um, uh, we uh, came out of the blocks, and we looked at hard at our cost models. We're taking everything that industry has talked to us about and, and challenging our cost estimating folks into uh, moving those kind of analog uh, industrial age parametrics into the digital age, and we've done that to some effect, but we've had a good, vigorous debate in the building uh, with DASA CE, with CAPE, 
and with the uh, program offices. Uh, what I'm happy to say is coming out of the Flora AOA, uh, three different models were within 8% of each other. And so, again, I think to good effect. Um, and when you look at what the CBO has said, uh, the CBO has said that, uh, you know, we've built a lean program by uh, putting our uh, costs, and these are procurement costs, into the, two, the last two decades. So we're not busting the bank uh, on our uh, future plan. And, and again, I think that drives into the, our cost consciousness, which is fundamental to our sustainment uh, plan. So with that, I yield my 24 seconds. Uh, we're actually in overtime, so I'll make, keep it real, real quick. Rosewood, thank you again. It's been an honor to serve on, uh, on such a panel, and especially to AUSA for having us do this. It's, it's been very, very important. I, didn't, I have about five questions I didn't get to, so if those folks knew they sent up a question, I'd be happy uh, to get your email address and get a colonel to sit down and, and type. <laughs> 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 I, I will actually answer it, sir, over to you. Thank you again.